your mind is, is an amazing thing, your mind. It truly is astounding. Um, you can reflect. Think about that. You can reflect. You have the ability to access stored memories, giving them serious thought and consideration. Introspection, that's looking in and seeing. We are able to observe and examine our own mental and emotional states, a psychological process that involves looking inward to examine our own thoughts, emotions, judgments, feelings, desires, convictions, perceptions, the ability to be self-aware. Think about it. You and I can think about thinking. We don't just think. We can think about thinking. We can step out of ourselves and reflect upon what our minds are doing. Your mind is truly amazing. And here's the thing. Your mind cannot be reduced to the brain. Psychology Today, September 2nd, 2023, just two months ago, said the human brain has been described as the most complex structure in the known universe. The brain contains around 86 billion neurons, 85 billion other cells, I don't know how, who had time to count these, um, over 100 trillion connections, 100 trillion connections, Several hundred million dollar research projects have failed to fully map the structure of the brain. The function of the brain is even more complex than its structure with consciousness as its greatest mystery. But your brain, although the arena of the mind or the spirit or soul to play in to manifest itself, it does not completely cage your mind. Your mind transcends your brain. The mind is not reducible to the brain. Like I said, it transcends it. Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9 tells us this. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And by the breath of his mouth, all their host. Verse 9, for he spoke and it was done. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. We might also consider John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things came into being through him and apart from him. Nothing came into being that has come into being. The scriptures consistently tell us that God existed prior to and transcendent of creation. That it, God, um, God who is divine mind, spirit, preceded matter. Spirit existed before that which we can touch and see and smell and taste and hear. One God, biblically speaking, to be divine, the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, denotes existence prior to and transcendent of creation. God is not dependent upon us. So when Moses asked him, when I return to the Israelites in bondage at your commission, who is it that's sending me? What is your name? And God gave the best answer, the only answer that he could, I am who I am. That's it. Ultimate reality, existence. You don't define me. I define you. I am. And because I am, you are. You're certainly, you've certainly heard of the adage, mind over matter. But here we're told, mind, God's spirit prior to matter. God as divine mind, divine spirit exists prior to and transcended of creation just as your mind and my mind transcends the physical hardware of our brains. Question, is there any evidence beyond the scriptures to actually believe that this divine mind, this divine spirit God existed to prior, prior to and transcended of creation? There are some who truly doubt God's existence his love for us, and the overall story of Scripture because of intellectual stumbling blocks. Truly struggling to recognize 
reasons to believe in him and the evidence pointing, to, pointing us to him. There are those who claim to be atheists for whatever cognitive reason. However, when we listen closely and ask them to share their reasons for doubt, that is belief in God's non-existence, because nobody believes nothing. If you're an atheist, you actually believe in God's non-existence. Um, some actually have intellectual stumbling blocks, but others, if we're so privileged to gaze through the window of their eyes into the soul of their pain, will, will, will often, often encounter scars of disappointment. Something went wrong. Something didn't work out the way we wanted it to, and they feel or we feel as if God has let us down. The expectation was here, but the reality was here. But what a comfort it is to read the real pain and anguish of King David and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who quoted him, cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22, Matthew 27, 46, Mark 15, 34. Where are you, Lord? Great men of faith, Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself, God in the flesh, were often those who cried out to God, in despair, with questions. Such doubters are longing for an authentic encounter with God, his rescue. And Jesus, echoing these words on the cross, at the very least reminds us how his heart resonates with the broken hearted and disappointed. But then there are those. So you've got those who doubt because of cognitive questions. You've got those who've had an emotional scarring or a disappointment. But then there are those who, whose doubt is more volitional. It's that fist raised against God. God, I don't want to hear from you. They're snarky. They're snide. And snide rhymes with pride. They come ready with many of the same cognitive, cognitive arguments against God. Can't trust the Bible. Uh, religion is just a crutch. All religions are basically the same. But if we keep digging deeper and they let their guard down and we find that they actually don't want anything to do with God at all. They want to be king. They want to sit on the throne. Absolute autonomy, rights without responsibility, and no accountability. They don't want to answer anyone, especially God. And if we're being honest, this type of skeptic isn't really bringing arguments against God, rather excuses to escape the eyes of God, resistance against God. Sometimes it helps if we know our audience. Who are we talking to? Is this someone who has cognitive doubt? Is it someone who's been emotionally scarred? Or they just don't want God telling them how to live. There are three types of doubt. Cognitive, emotional, experiential, and volitional. Good to know who we're talking to, who we're dealing with. Different types of doubt, different types of struggles. The Bible teaches that mind, though, the mind of God, precedes matter. And since the mind is not reducible to the brain, our minds serve as some of the most compelling evidence outside of Scripture for God's existence, that we have been created in His image. There is no source for the mind. Think about this. Your mind, there is no source for it in this world. You can't go out there and find a, a, a mine that gives you mind. It's not in a rock somewhere. You cannot go to a tree and find a mind in it. Our minds are different. They're from somewhere else, and I believe one of the greatest evidences for God's existence. Skeptic attempts to often take one or two broader maneuvers. They will say the mind is reduced to the physical, and therefore it's an illusion. Think about it. Your mind, they will say, is nothing but an illusion. Imagine trying to live that out. A second approach they'll take, it is somehow mysteriously emerging from your brain, which really is no explanation at all. But those are the two leading maneuvers that skeptics make when talking about the non-physical transcendent human features. They will also do this with morality. Morality isn't real, they'll say. It's just an illusion. It's just something that we've made up. But think about it. If the mind is merely an illusion, think about it. If the mind is merely an illusion or a mysterious emergence, can we really hold criminals accountable for the actions that they've done? For acting upon their evil intents? And if the mind is merely an illusion, we might ask the person arguing for that position, may I apply that to you? Who is this illusion speaking to me, telling me that the mind is just an illusion? You see the problem? It's, it's unlivable. 
telling me that human consciousness and mind are nothing more than an illusion. It's self-defeating. C.S. Lewis, uh, you've probably heard of him, the uh, writer of the Chronicles of Narnia and many other great books, he says this, unless human reasoning is valid, no science can be true. No account of the universe can be true unless that account leaves it possible for our thinking to be a real insight. A theory which explained everything else in the whole universe, but which made it possible to believe that our thinking was, was valid, would be utter, uh, that our thinking wasn't valid, sorry, would be utterly out of court. For that theory would itself have been reached by thinking. And if thinking is not valid, that theory would, of course, be itself demolished. Thus, a strict materialism refutes itself for the reason given long ago by Professor Haldane, if my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true, and hence I have no reason for supposing my brain is to be composed of atoms. Think about it. Your mind transcends your brain. Wilder Penfield is known as the father of neurosurgery. Um, and he conducted experiments. Now, this is a little strange. I will, I will admit that. Um, and I chose my, my pictures uh, carefully when showing uh, Wilder Penfield. He, he composed experiments that strongly imply the existence of a human mind, a soul, or a spirit that transcends uh, the brain. You, you, might, you might have heard the phrase, there is a ghost in the machine. And, th and that's exactly what we're saying. There is a part to us that is not physical. And, and that's when we interact with each other, that's what we're engaging. Um, he was a philosophical materialist, but Penfield originally assumed that human consciousness originated in the physical neural activity, the nerves and the synopses firing. And throughout his entire professional career, he, like many other scientists, as well, occupied his time attempting to prove that the brain was responsible for the spirit, the soul, or the mind, or the consciousness. But through thousands of operations on epileptics, he kept running into evidence that the brain and the mind, or the spirit, were separated, although they somehow are integrated. Now, Penfield, would, he would stimulate parts of the brain. He would use, like, electroshock waves, um, responsible for motor functions with his patients. And while they were conscious, think about this, they were awake when this was happening, um, and he would tell them, for example, he would have them raise their hands. And then he would say, um, he would say, stop that. And you would find that they would grab their hand with the other one and try to hold it down. Well, what's going on there? The brain is, being, is operating this one because he figures out how to steer it, but then the will of the person is saying stop. And sometimes he would ask the patients, why did you do that? And they would say, that wasn't me, that was you. Well, who's saying that wasn't me, that was you? Do you see the problem? The brain does not contain the mind. There is a ghost within the machine. You are a spirit. You are a mind. You are a soul. You are not just a physical uh, lump of cells. Um, now, skeptics will argue in response to this that if the brain is damaged, the mind of a person also appears to be damaged. However, we can respond by pointing out this is to be expected on, as Christians, as Bible-believing Christians, um, because the brain is the avenue or the channel through which the mind, the spirit, and the soul, the ghost in the machine, if you will, engages the physical world. And if that channel or that arena or whatever you want to call it is damaged, of course the, the spirit will not be able to manifest itself in the physical world. Um, they've only, they haven't disproven that we, are, that we have a spirit, that we are spirit or a mind. They've only insisted on their preconceived notions and conclusions. Penfield, even Penfield noted, it is exciting to discover that even scientists are justified in their belief in the existence of the spirits. Sir Charles Sherrington was a professor of physiology and Nobel Prize winner, and he described, he was described as a genius who laid the foundations for our knowledge of the function between the spinal cord and the brain. This is some some super uh, intelligent science stuff. Five days prior to his own death, he must have understood that he was going to die soon. He said, for me, the human soul is now the only reality. 
Matthew 10, 28 tells us, we're told by Jesus, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The martyrs of the early, uh, earliest centuries of the church saw many people become followers of Jesus due to their courageous willingness to pay the ultimate price for their faith. They knew that the resurrection was true. They knew that there was life after death, that the, that the soul survives the dead body. But unfortunately, in today's society, we modern Christians oftentimes can't even bear the thought of someone disagreeing with us, let alone um, that we might have to pay the ultimate price. How often are we ashamed to represent the Lord publicly? We seem to be trading the God of all creation, who made all of this, for the God of cultural approval and appropriation. German scientist uh, Werner Gitz, I actually got to meet him, and we, I, I got to be a translator at a couple apologetics conferences for a couple British guys that were speaking. He, he used to, if I'm not mistaken, he used to be responsible for setting the atomic clock in Germany. This guy's a real brilliant um, uh, information scientist, he talks about the five components of information in his book, In the Beginning Was the Information. And he says this, there are five components, and if you don't have all of them, you don't have information. There's an apobatic. It is a desired result. And a desired result implies a sender and a reached goal, the recipient. There's a pragmatic, and expected actions by the sender and un, um, applied actions by the recipient. There's a semantic, those are shared thoughts by the sender and understood meaning by the recipient. There's a syntax, that is the code, the applied code by the sender and understood code by the recipient. There's a statistic, a transferred signal by the sender, received signal by the recipient. You have to have all five components or you do not have information. Consistent atheists have reduced information to the physical realm. They basically say it's only the code, but do you see what the problem is? Information transcends the code. Information is not just a code. It is more than the code. It's a message. It's an, it's an expected action, and it's applied signal, all of these things. And so Git will say this, the process of the emergence of information is a spiritual process. Think about that. By spiritual, he means non-physical. We, uh, we use information. How often do you use information? Non-stop, right? We, we're constantly using information. So we are constantly engaged in the spiritual, the non-physical world. Yet atheists, if they want to be consistent, have to deny it because they say everything is just matter or nature. And here, staring in their faces is one of the best evidences and pointers to the spiritual world into God's existence. And so sender and recipient, Git says, are both intelligent and independent of one another. Both are individuals that are equipped with personal will and personal intelligence. In fact, your body, your DNA, as you know, has, I, I, can't, I don't even know the number, um, just millions and millions and millions of, of, of amounts of, uh, of information stored in them. And, and so information is all around us. I mean, God's evidence for God is just everywhere. It's, it's in your DNA. Git believes that he has empirically demonstrated the existence of the spiritual world or a spiritual aspect of our reality. And I recall him pointing out hard drives do not gain weight or add mass when humans are typing into computers. Think about it. You're adding information, but it's not gaining in mass, therefore underlining the fact that we are part of a spiritual reality. J.P. Moreland correctly defines this non-material reality or spiritual world aspect to our ex existence in conjunction with the bodies as dualism. Now, this is not to be confused with religious dualism, which has two gods competing, competing against each other. This is the dualism that says we're both physical and spiritual, and, uh, and, and that's our reality. In his interview with Lee Strobel in The Case for the Creator, he argued that states of consciousness differ from brain states. They are personal and kept secret from the outside world. For example, I can't cut open your skull and find your memories in your brain. You have to tell me about them if I want, if you, if I want to know something about you. I must ask you, and you have to be honest, if I am to have knowledge and truth about what's going on inside of you. Think about it. 
If the physicalists or the metaphysical naturalists, materialists, were correct in their view of human consciousness, that it is merely an illusion or emergent, then one, consciousness would not exist. Free will would not exist. We, would, we wouldn't be able to hold each other accountable for the, the evil that we do, for example, bad moral behavior, and there would be no intermediate state. Uh, another piece of evidence that has become very popular and is very well attested are known as near-death experiences and outer body experiences. Now, I have not experienced this personally, but uh, to my knowledge, there are thousands and thousands of these things recorded across the globe. We do have a video on this by uh, Brian, Dr. Brian Chilton, who is a hospice um, uh, pastor. And, and he, he does some research on outer body experiences and near-death experiences, which seem to imply that there, is, that there is, shortly around the time of death, there is a transcendence that occurs from the, of the spirit of the body. During Vietnam, during the war, it became clear just how influenced the U.S. government had been, uh, and the Pentagon, by post-enlightenment metaphysical naturalism. And B.F. Skinner's... Uh, a philosophy known as behaviorism. They, they attempted to bomb the Vietnamese soldiers into conditioned submission. The, they, they thought if we just bomb and back off, bomb and back off, bomb and back off, eventually they'll just give up. I mean, they're just, they're just a, a lump of cells. They're just a robot. Eventually you'll give up. But the Vietnamese did not give up. Why is that? It didn't work. Because the Vietnamese were more than just a collected physical brains that reacted to stimuli. They had feelings. They had desires. They had pride and convictions. They were in a state of mind to decide to suffer for their convictions, and the U.S. eventually had to back off. This is uh, from the case for Creator with an uh, interview with J.P. Moreland. Why? It demonstrates that we are not just some physical robots. The mind cannot be reduced to the brain. Although the brain interacts with the mind, that is, the brain is the arena in, within which our minds interact with this world, the mind, the spirit, the soul manifests itself through our brains into the physical world. Think about it. Think about the intricacies of emotions that the human facial muscles can express. Think about that. Your facial muscles and nerves serve as the canvas for Enorm an enormous tapestry of emotional expressions. Think about how amazing the face is, all the different emotions it can express. Consider this. All the cells in our bodies are constantly dying and regenerating. Maybe you've heard this before. This is a fascinating marvel of God's handiwork. Even the dense cells of your bones are replaced every decade. Think about that. And if I'm, a, if I'm a consistent atheist, if I'm a consistent naturalist, shouldn't I then treat you as a different person 10 years later? But you, if I did that, you would say, well, Brett, you're crazy. I'm the same person. Yes, I've grown. I've had some experiences, but, I, but I'm, uh, I'm still Dan Chastine. I'm not someone else, right? You wouldn't say that's a different person. Those who committed who are committed to metaphysical naturalism should be consistent and treat people as if they are completely different people every decade. If mind and morality were reducible to the physical, we should then release hardened criminals for things they did 10 years ago. Murderers, child molesters, terrorists. Or don't we know, on some spiritual level, that the old Charles Manson, when he was finishing out his life in prison, with the swastika on his head, you know, all the awful things he had done, that he was still responsible for all those women's lives he had destroyed, even late in life. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, to be away from the body is to be at home with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.8, our videographer, Christy, this, she tra travels around, Christy Graves, and records our videos. She does some amazing work for our ministry uh, traveling lots of miles, working long hours. She lost her grandfather just a few weeks, James Pierce. I got to talk to him on the phone once. Very, very uh, committed follower of Jesus. Um, and, his, and her words were this, and I know this is a common thing we say as followers of Jesus. His faith has now become sight. 
And I love this description because somehow, on some spiritual level, we know, although we no longer have our eyes, although, although um, uh, you know, the things of this world, we, we're dependent upon our senses to engage the physical things of this world, but at times they can actually limit us from seeing the spiritual world. God, as he truly is, spirit. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Colossians 1.17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Think about John 4.24. Jesus is there in Samaria talking to the woman at the well, right? You know this story. He's talking to the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, and the Lord said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, what are spirit and truth? What are spirit and truth? Spirit and truth are properties of a non-physical reality. They are properties of the mind. The mind is spiritual, that is non-physical. You are so much more than just your bodies. Your mind is one of the most amazing, powerful pieces of evidence pointing to the existence of God. Ironically, skeptics cannot engage in their own skepticism without borrowing this amazing gift of God. Think about it. Skeptics have to use thoughts to deny God. It's one of the biggest ironies we deal with. And we need to figure out ways, brothers and sisters, to lovingly and gently point this out. You're borrowing from God to deny him. You're borrowing from God to deny him. I ask you, brothers and sisters, are you loving God with all of your mind? Not with only your mind, not with only your mind, but with all of it. Are we loving God with all of our minds? When we read his word, are we meditating on the mind of God and what he's speaking to us, what he's done in the past to reveal himself? When you worship him, is your mind engaged with his? When was the last time where you just set everything aside and went out into God's creation and just took it all in? Just took it all in, Psalm 19, and pondered the heavens declaring the glories of God. There's nothing wrong with, with just allowing God to spoil us with his creation. Um, or his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature that can be seen and understood, Romans 1 in creation, but also in us, because we are part of creation. Your mind points to his mind. Secularist Jerry Coyne, I'll close with this. Think about this. Think about the irony of the, what this atheist here is saying. Yes, secularism does propose a physical and purposeless universe. And many, but not all of us, accept that notion that, if, that our sense of self is a neural illusion. So he takes the illusion route. But although the universe is purposeless, note that he said that, the universe is purposeless, our lives aren't. Where does he get a sense of purpose if the universe is purposeless? This conflation of purposeless universe, that is, not, one not created by a transcendent being or specific reason, with purposeless human lives is a trick that the faithful use to make atheism seem dark and nihilistic. But we make our own purposes, and they're real. Right now, my purpose is to write this piece, and then I'll work on a book I'm writing, and later I'll have dinner with a friend. Soon I'll go to Poland to visit more friends. Maybe later I'll read a nice book and learn something. Soon I'll be teaching biology to graduate students. Those are real purposes, not the illusory purposes to which Christian theists want to devote our only life. Note the contradiction surrounding meaning versus meaningless. You cannot say, you can't even have a concept of something being meaningless unless you have a concept of there being meaning. And atheists, we, God loves them, and we need to love them too. They deny God, but in order to deny God, they have to have a concept of that which they're denying. And they know that he exists, and we are all without excuse. You cannot deny meaning without first having a concept of it. So how can we help those in our world running from God to see and comprehend that we are all without excuse, that God has left evidence of his existence all around us if we would just have eyes to see and ears to hear? 
that our skeptical friends are actually borrowing from God's gifts the mind to deny him. And brothers and sisters, we are that which has been made in his divine attributes can seen clearly in us. Let's go make him known to the world, brothers and sisters. Who is God going to bring into your life this next year, this holiday season, this week, that you can have this conversation with? Help to help believe and see that God is there and that he truly loves them and wants to have a relationship with him. Who is going to come to know our Lord and Savior this coming year because you were prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have and that you are willing to have those tough, long, extended conversations? Who is God trying to reach through you? Who is going to be sitting here next year when I, Lord willing, am able to return? I don't know, but that would be amazing. And if you want to dig deeper into this, I've just brought some resources. Um, I suggest Lee Strobel's interview with J.P. Moreland from The Case of the Creator. I've, I've borrowed from that. Dinesh D'Souza writes a book, Life After Death, Moreland. Love the Lord your God with all your mind. Oz Guinness, Oz Guinness excuse me. God in the Dark, and we have a video by Brian Chilton on near-death experiences. Let's go and show that God exists and that your mind is one of the best evidences to the existence of God. Let's pray. Father God, you are amazing. And although we can't see you with our eyes right now, we trust you, Lord. We trust you. Lord, we have questions. We have scars. We're broken. We need you. Um, Sometimes we don't understand. We have uncertainties. We confess that to you. Lord, we believe. Please help our unbelief. But God, we ask that you would use us, Lord, to reach people. I ask, God, that you would use this congregation, the Fellowship in Christ Christian Church, that you would use all my dear brothers and sisters here today to bring people to you because, Lord, you want children, spiritual children, through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. who paid for our sins. And Lord, I ask that you would just use us as your hand and feet. Thank you so much for this day. Give us open doors for your word in Jesus' name.